Hi everybody. I'd like to talk about the future of artificial intelligence. The slides are available at slideshare.net forward slash Lablaga. I'm a technology theorist at Purdue University in the philosophy department. The future of AI. I propose that when we consider blockchain and deep learning together, this suggests the emergence of a new class of global network computing systems. These systems are self-operating computation graphs that make probabilistic guesses about reality states of the world. We might wonder, what are we running on networks? Initially, it was information in the 1980s. Now, we're running money and value on networks with blockchain technology. Value tokening is an idea. And in the farther future, we might be running brains and intelligence on networks in the 2050s and beyond, perhaps. The uh, one idea is thought tokening, exactly the way we're tokening value now with blockchain networks. The future of I, I propose, is that there have been two fundamental eras of network computing. These are, first of all, simple networks for transferring information, but now smart networks for transferring value and later transferring intelligence. What is AI? Artificial intelligence, per the Encyclopedia Britannica definition, is a computer performing tasks that are typically associated with intelligent beings. There is a creeping frontier of technology in that we quickly forget our amazing achievements on problems that seem to be hard and intractable. AI, in some sense, is whatever we just can't quite do yet. What is the AI problem that everybody is worried about? The idea is that computer capabilities can grow faster than human capabilities. Therefore, one day computers might become vastly more capable than humans i.e. super intelligent, and willfully or inadvertently present a danger to humans. The, uh, there was a study for global existential risk. It was conducted informally at a conference, and conference goers overall felt that there was possibly a 19% risk that humans might inadvertently extinct themselves before 2100. This was of all possible causes, ranging from nuclear wars to superintelligent AI to bioplagues and nanotechnology. So the idea is that our technology would have standardized ethics modules, both for roboethics, how the machine behaves, and robotic it, how the machine interacts with others. There have been examples recently with Facebook creating its own AI bots and the OpenAI Dota 2 video game victory. Further, Instagram has implemented nice filters to eliminate hate speech, and we have found that criminal justice systems algorithms indeed discriminate. So we know that it's time to have standard AI ethics modules as a component of our technology, and this is one thing that the newly formed DeepMind Ethics and Society Research uh, effort has decided to focus upon. So we might wonder, is our human future doomed when machines might be vastly more capable than us? But really the question is how can we better collaborate humans and machines together, as Tyler Cowman notes in Average is Over, is really the, uh, the best team for the job, a human and a machine together. Technological unemployment is the idea of outsourcing jobs to technology where the key challenge is facilitating an orderly transition to the automation economy. Half of economists wonder why, uh, or point out that perhaps uh, half of jobs may be at risk of automation in the next two decades, and other economists wonder, in fact, why there are still so many jobs in a world that could be automated more quickly. The future of work as meaningful engagement of human capacities is definitely a question, and how we are to collaborate with machines in ways that make sense and empower us. I think in the longer term, why perhaps we're not automating more quickly is that we don't know what our identity would be as humans in a non-labor economy. 
for so long, we've had to define ourselves by, based on our jobs, our labor effort, and we don't know who we are without our labor jobs. And so until we have an answer to that, we won't be able to move forward into the automation economy. We need a better and new productive engagement of our t activities that incorporates higher levels of Maslow's needs diagram. Another social movement at the moment is that perhaps the privacy pendulum will be swinging back. Historically, we had lots of privacy, but we've been in a surveillance, surveillance world where there's been a strange logic of a few bad apples, meaning that somehow we surveil everybody, but we don't do it well. We have centralized uh, bre breaches of our centralized data stores, such as Equifax. And so the future era might be one where we swing back to have towards having more privacy, restoring some of the checks and balances like in the original system that George Washington conceived. When we think about the future of AI, I think three main technology areas are going to be crucial, and they are big data and deep learning, blockchain, and bioprinting all of the advances in genomics and CRISPR editing. There here is some, a couple of charts in regard to the top uh, market disruptors for enterprise being deep learning and blockchain. And that the top uh, job skill growth in demand is in robotics, automation, deep learning, and data science, and also Bitcoin and blockchain. The farther future is smart networks, that artificial intelligence will be operating on smart networks where intelligence is baked into the network, blockchains that confirm authenticity and transfer value, and deep learning algorithms that conduct predictive identification of objects on, on the net. We start to see more and more different kinds of species of networks dominating our world. So we're aware of social networks, transportation, communication, information, and a variety of biological networks ranging from superorganisms, ecosystems, uh, organisms, and plants, to now finance, credit, and payment networks, and also deep learning networks. In conclusion, the future of AI smart networks, I propose, is that we are starting to run more complicated operations on networks, information in the past, money in the present, and brains in the future. Two fundamental eras of network computing are simple networks for the transfer of information, all computing to date from mainframes to mobile, and now a new era of smart networks for the transfer of value and intelligence. Blockchain and deep learning are built directly into smart networks so that they may be automatically used to confirm authenticity and transfer value with blockchain and predictably identify individual items and patterns with deep learning. Thank you. Intro to blockchain. I wrote a best-selling book called Blockchain, Blueprint for a New Economy to inspire us to build this world. A blockchain or distributed ledger is a software protocol. Just as SMTP is a protocol for sending email Blockchain is a protocol for sending money on the internet. In more technical detail, blockchain is the tamper-resistant distributed ledger software underlying cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin for recording and transferring data and assets such as financial transactions and real estate titles via the internet without needing a third-party intermediary. How does it work? You use your e-wallet app to send money. If I want to send money to my friend, I open up my e-wallet app, such as Bread Wallet, Mycelium, or Coinbase. I scan the recipient's address, I enter the amount, and submit the transaction. In a few moments, the money will appear in the recipient's wallet, in their wallet app. One point is that my wallet doesn't have money, it has keys. It has a public-private uh, key pair addressing system such that every uh, transaction is uniquely encoded. When I want to send money, my private key checks that I have the ability to transfer this money, checking out on the internet ledger balance, 
and signs a unique signature allowing the transfer of this money. Then when the network receives this transaction, the software knows how to confirm that indeed this is a valid transaction. What happens in the back end is that the transactions are submitted to the cloud mempool, a memory pool of transactions, at a certain uh, location in the cloud. And every 10 minutes, uh, mining software comes by and grabs a chunk of the latest block of transactions. And then these mining ASICs compete to see which one is going to be the one to actually record these transactions. The way that mining machines compete is that the same software network, the Bitcoin software, issues a random number every, 20, every 10 minutes. This is called a nonce. It's a 32 character number about which some of the cryptographic parameters are known. And then the mining machines, all uh, of the many probably hundreds and thousands and millions and possibly billions of ASICs, making guesses at the rate of four billion per second as to the uh, for, as to this random number. At, one, at random, one machine will guess closest to the nonce, the random number, and get the, um, win the ability to record the transaction and get the reward. Then that block, uh, that miner updates the chain with the new block, which, call, which has a hash or a little signature of the previous block, which thereby chains all previous blocks together in an immutable locked uh, link, linked uh, transaction database and updates, um, updates the chain with a new block. The ledger balances then reflect the transaction, the new transaction balances, and the block is uh, uh, sent out to all of the distributed nodes worldwide that maintain the software transaction ledger. This is a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, currently consisting of approximately 11,000 nodes in the case of the Bitcoin network. Uh, any person is free to host the Bitcoin blockchain node, the transaction ledger. You just download it from GitHub, and uh, this is peer, voluntary peer network contributed uh, infrastructure. Bitcoin mining, more specifically, as I mentioned, is the accounting function to record the transactions. It's fee-based. It works uh, in the way that mining ASICs find new blocks, discover new blocks, with a proof-of-work software mechanism. Um, as I mentioned, what happens is that, that the network regularly issues random 32-bit nonces for specified cryptographic parameters and the mining software and hardware constantly makes nonce guesses at a rate of four billion per second. One machine at random guesses the correct, uh, uh, correct random number and wins the ability to confirm and record the transactions and update the other nodes. The wasteful effort is, makes the system very secure. However, it is wondered uh, and thought that we'll probably evolve to other kinds of similarly random random entropy-based type systems with many, many network machines randomly guessing to record transactions, but that aren't quite so uh, wasteful in their consumption of electricity. That would be the future method. So distributed networks is the idea that we've had three different kinds of network architectures, those that are centralized and hierarchical, those that are decentralized based on hubs and spokes, and those that are distributed like the Bitcoin blockchain, just truly flat peer nodes, no one node having any different status than any other. The radical notion of peer nodes is that each node can be a peer who provides services to others. And indeed, that's exactly what happens currently. The transaction ledger is hosted by um, by peer nodes. Transaction confirmation and logging happen by mining peer nodes. And now we're starting to see service uh, applications on the network beyond network operations, including news and then with payment channels, possibly banking. There are two kinds of distributed ledgers, public and private. Public being like Bitcoin and Ethereum which are truly open public chains, identity is not known, and many, um, many users are preferring even 
higher grades of privacy, such as Zcash and uh, Monero. And there's been an announcement recently that Ethereum will be including zero knowledge proofs to make its chain even more private. The other uh, kind of chains are enterprise chains, or also called private. Private in the sense that they're like a corporate VPN, that only permissioned credentialed users can perform certain operations. So the R3 Corda chain or the IBM Hyperledger fabric, these are all enterprise chains that would be uh, where users would be known and credentialed. There are four classes of blockchain applications. Number one, money and financial instruments. Number two, property, uh, auto and house titles, for example. Number three, contractual relations, such as partnership agreements and wills. And number four, identity management operations, such as visas and passports. Thank you. Intro to deep learning. We know that our world is one of big data. However, big data is not smart data. Even though the global data volume is estimated to be 40 exabits by 2020, the data contributing factors in data growth are scientific, governmental, corporate, and personal data stores. The issue is that big data requires deep learning. Our older algorithms are not keeping up with the growth in big data, and we need new data science methods to extract understanding from the data. Within the broader computer science context, there is the computer science discipline. Within that, the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, within that, machine learning. Within that, neural nets. And within that, deep learning. Really, a lot of AI uh, budget and research focus at the moment is on deep learning. Deep learning, what it is, conceptually, deep learning is a software program that can identify what something is. Technically, deep learning is a class of machine learning algorithms in the form of a neural network that uses a cascade of layers or tiers of processing units to extract features from data and make predictive guesses about new data. Deep learning and AI is uh, an interesting point in that the system itself is dumb, it's mechanical. The system learns, so to speak, with big data, having lots of input examples and making trial and error guesses to adjust weights and biases to identify key features. The system creates a predictive method of identifying new examples. The AI argument is that big enough data is what makes a difference. Finally having big enough data is what makes a difference. We're running fairly simple, straightforward algorithms over very large data sets, and this is what helps us uh, have results. The pictures at the bottom indicate the three key steps. Number one is the input being very big data, many, many examples. Step two is the method of using trial and error guesses to adjust computation graph node weights. And number three, such that the output system correctly identifies new examples. For example, uh, we feed a deep learning system a photo and we want it to identify what something is. It creates an image recognition system that determines which features are relevant at increasingly higher levels of abstraction and correctly identifies new examples. There are two types of deep learning, supervised and unsupervised. Supervised where we classify labeled data and unsupervised where the system finds patterns in unlabeled data. We have created the amazing labeled data resource of YouTube cat videos in the sense that there are over uh, about a hundred million cat videos on YouTube. That means there's a video of cats and it's labeled with meta text called cat. <laughs> and so this allows us to run uh, deep learning algorithms over YouTube. And indeed this is exactly how Google had some early results in 2012 of computers teaching themselves to recognize faces of humans and cats. 
The current news in May of 2017 was that Google's deep learning algorithms reached a 95% threshold of machines being indistinguishable from humans at recognizing objects. There are two main kinds of deep learning nets. One is convolutional neural nets used for image recognition. They convolve, that is, they roll up to higher levels of abstraction in feature set recognition, and recurrent neural nets speech used for speech, text, and audio recognition. Uh, RNNs recur, that is, iterate over sequential inputs with a memory function, often using an LSTM, a long short-term memory function, which remembers which sequences might be salient and avoids grading and vanishing, uh, avoids uh, hitting limits in its analysis. There are three key technical principles to deep learning. First of all is to map your problem into a sigmoid function or a logistical, uh, logistic regression. So no matter how complicated uh, the inputs are, you map them all onto an equation that will deliver some sort of answer between, on an S-curve between zero and one or minus one and one. And that means this S-curve gives you the ability to optimize using all of the tools of calculus that are, are at our disposal. Uh, also having answers that can be neatly read on a basis of zero to one gives computing algorithms an easier task of identifying uh, samples as to uh, yes or no, this is the kind of sample we're looking for. The second principle is a perceptron structure. So this is a core computational unit, an input processing output unit that is used in the network with the levers of weights and biases to adjust what happens with that computing node. But the perceptrons are purely modular, Lego-like bricks that we just build up into millions or billions of them in different, different tiers of computation across the system where the dumb system learns by adjusting the parameters and checking uh, against the outcome. The third key technical principle of deep learning is the loss function, where we use uh, calculus to reduce combinatoric dimensionality, particularly a loss function to optimize the efficiency of the solution. How, they're called deep learning nets, but how do they actually learn? The neural net actually uh, learns, or we say that in the sense that it's a structural system based on cascading layers of neurons with variable parameters of weights and biases. The system varies the weights and biases, which are uh, a component of each computing node, uh, to see if a better outcome may be obtained per small tweaks. We repeat this method until the net correctly classifies the data. Uh, <clears throat> you can quickly see the problem that might arise, which is that it's inefficient to test the combinatorial explosion of all possible parameter variations. So the solution proposed in a 1986 paper is back propagation, and back propagation continues to be a key research focus. We back propagate the errors and gradient descent through the network as an optimization method to adjust and calculate the error contribution of each particular neuron or node after a batch of data is processed. Thank you. I would like to talk about the concept of deep learning chains, which is blockchain and deep learning together. Considering blockchain and deep learning together suggests the emergence of a new class of global network computing systems. These systems are self-operating computation graphs that make probabilistic guesses about reality states of the world. We might wonder, what are we running on networks? We're running information as of the 1980s. We're now starting to run value and money on networks in the 2010s and 2020s with blockchain. And in the farther future, we might be running intelligence on networks, brain files, mind files. This would be in the 2050s and beyond, perhaps. The idea is that we might uh, have thought 
not tokening in the same way we have value tokening with blockchains currently. I propose that the future of AI is smart networks. There have been two fundamental eras of computing. First, running simple networks for the transfer of information. And this has comprised all of our activity so far from mainframes to mobile. Now though, we are entering a second network era of smart networks, transferring value now on networks, and in the farther future, perhaps transferring intelligence. The idea is that the intelligence is baked into the smart network such that blockchains confirm authenticity and transfer value, and deep learning algorithms predictively identify what things are. Deep learning chains is the notion that there is cross-functionality between the two platforms. There are deep learning applications for blockchain in the sense of using TensorFlow for fee estimation, predictive pattern recognition for security, fraud, privacy, and anti-money laundering, deep learning techniques such as the back propagation of errors, gradient descent, and loss curves can be used to optimize financial graphs, and the formulation of debt credit payment problems as sigmoidal optimizations uh, can be used in deep learning networks uh, to, to solve with these techniques. On the other hand, there are also blockchain applications for deep learning. Secure automation, registry, logging, tracking, and remuneration functionality for deep learning systems as they go online will be an important security parameter. Likewise, blockchain as a service for network operations. We could have long short-term memories as a payment channel mechanism. There could be blockchain peer-to-peer -peer nodes that provide deep learning network services security, such as spatial recognition, and identification and authorization. I'm going to outline five different deep learning chains applications. The first is autonomous driving, drone delivery, and social robotics. The idea is that deep learning nets, in particular convolutional neural nets, are needed to identify what things are. And then blockchain functionality is needed for the secure automation technology to track arbitrarily many units, audit and upgrade them, and for legal liability, accountability, and remuneration. The second deep learning chains application is big health data. We have big data, but not big health data, to deliver on the promise of AI where finally having big enough data sets and running straightforward algorithms over them yields results. In the idea of big health data, we would want to have large scale secure predictive analysis of big health data stores to understand disease prevention. It's amazing that the leading company Illumina has genome sequenced 18,000 people so far, but there are 7.5 billion people in the world. The third deep learning chains application is using them as a leapfrog technology for human potential. For financial inclusion, we note that 2 billion worldwide are underbanked, 1.1 billion without a recognized form of ID, 70% lack access to land registries. Health inclusion is an issue too, as 400 million do not have access to health services. It, and it does not make sense to build out brick and mortar bank branches and medical clinics to every last mile in a world of digital services. Instead, we might have e-wallet and deep learning medical diagnostic apps on our cell phones. The fourth application of deep learning chains is enacting friendly AI. The idea is that digital intelligences running on consensus managed smart networks, not in isolation, will need to be in good reputational standing to conduct their operations. Transactions are to access resources like fundraising, providing services, entering into contracts, and retiring will all be needed to uh, will all need to be settled by being in good reputational standing on the smart network. The smart network consensus only validates and records bona fide tra transactions from good agents. And in this way, we can enforce friendly agents, 
uh, behavior on smart networks. The fifth deep learning chains application is even before enacting friendly AI to have a deep thinkers registry where we register deep learners with blockchains and monitor them with deep learning algorithms. This provides a secure tracking and a remuneration uh, functionality. Some of the examples for this already would be tracking autonomous lab robots that are engaged in IP discovery, roving agricultural bots, manufacturing bots, intelligent gaming characters, and Go playing algorithms, AlphaGo could be registered in the Deep Thinkers Registry. <clears throat> in conclusion, deep learning chains are needed for next generation challenges such as financial inclusion, big health data, global energy trading, and getting to space. Smart networks are a new form of automated global infrastructure that both identifies what things are with deep learning algorithms and validates, confirms, and routes transactions with blockchains. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I wanted to provide a market update on blockchain economics. What is going on at the moment? Let's put on our mindset of innovation because someone is going to invent the Netscape and Google of blockchains, finally a killer app that makes this technology usable and useful. First of all, the Scaling Bitcoin Conference held at, at Stanford at the beginning of November 2017 featured papers in four main themes, privacy, scalability, cryptography, and smart contracts. So the first idea is that more and more we're moving to private privacy on chains, both in the enterprise chains and in individual chains, using ZK proofs, zero knowledge proofs. And there are very many uh, different proposals for how we might do this. The idea of bullet proofs is that we have a very small logarithmic signature by which we can confirm and capitulate uh, trans and secure transactions. But the idea is that more and more we would be expecting uh, confidential transactions that the sender and recipient address and transaction amount are hidden in the transactions that we're conducting, whether on private networks or public networks. And Ethereum has recently announced the integration of ZK uh, zero knowledge proofs on their chain. And we would be expecting uh, this kind of functionality to be accompanying all kinds of enterprise and personal uh, individual chains. The second idea is scalability, that we'll be having thinner and thinner clients by which we can easily submit blockchain transactions. Uh, there is a new explorer called BlockSci. It's a platform that you could pour any chain's data into and analyze uh, the activity on that chain. And the uh, other kinds of ideas for greater scalability of the blockchain. This is especially important since we just um, just forewent the hard fork upgrade now in November to SegWit 2x, although we did move to SegWit already in a soft fork in August, which allows Lightning's uh, payment channels. The third point would be about cryptography, that we're using el elliptical curve cryptography currently. We're possibly moving to Schnorr signatures and beyond to quantum cryptography. And then uh, finally, that smart contracts, payment channels, these kinds of consumable, escrowed, contractual arrangements over time are very much an up and coming area of development with blockchain systems. So blockchain investing is progressing at par. Uh, the first key point is that cumulatively, ICOs, initial coin offerings, have raised more money than VC funding in the crypto space. Um, although we should also mention that perhaps a lot of, perhaps some VC money comes via ICO, but the two uh, main classificatory measures, ICOs versus VCs, indicate that cumulatively ICOs have raised 3.5 billion, whereas VC fundings have raised 2.7 billion in the period uh, from 2014 to present, to October 2017. 
the key idea is that ICOs have forever changed how we think about fundraising and interacting with our investments in projects and companies via the concept of token. So a token is not just money, but it has very many functions. So it is also used for voting, dividends, access, participation, and notification. And so the idea of a token that has multiple functions is an idea that is probably here to stay. In we know that in July, the US ruled on ICOs, that if they, on a one, uh, they are evaluated on a one-by-one uh, one one basis, and if they uh, are bark like a stock, then they are a stock, and they must be registered um, as a stock. And so a lot of this really uh, separates the wheat from the chaff in that perhaps 99% of ICOs are um, uh, poor quality and 1% are registered with the SEC. They may qualify for a small issuance uh, exemption, uh, but they are bona fide regulated offering. Um, other countries have have uh, different stances on ICOs. The UK is not ruling, they're banned in China. Germany recently indicated they're dangerous, uh, warning investors. Russia said they'll have something to say by year end. Um, so it's very much a national jurisdictional kind of situation. The cryptocurrency market cap is currently $200 billion. These are all of the cryptocurrencies. Um, Bitcoin is, is uh, half, a $100 billion market cap. And uh, together, the 200 billion is on the order of a 50, 50th largest country economy. So still tiny compared to the S&P's $22 billion, it's nevertheless a substantial amount. The third point is that we're starting to see more in institutional products in the investment space. Ledger X Options, which cleared a million dollars worth of business in the first week and two million dollars in the second week, and upcoming uh, Bitcoin futures expected both on CME and CBOE. So this is significant because there is huge demand for cryptographic assets by institutional investors, and they could really start uh, engaging with this product. Private chains start are start also starting to enjoy more and more activity, particularly Monero and Zcash, and people using the Shift uh, Bitcoin Visa card which has a live connection to the Coinbase account. Uh, crypto transactions typically run at 1% as opposed to credit card transactions running at 3 to 4%. So I think one thing we might start to see is the privacy pendulum swinging back towards having more privacy after this era of surveillance that hasn't really worked out well when we have big breaches like Equifax. Privacy is just the first battle, in my view, and the larger stakes over the 100-year time frame are those for societal structure. We may see different e and emergent ways for how our society is organized. The crypto enlightenment is well underway. We're implementing the economic piece, and the government piece is also there, where per Kant, uh, he urges us that we ought to think autonomously free of the dictates of the external authority, and perhaps cryptographic voting systems and governance models may enable us to do so. Thank you. One of the most important concepts to understand in blockchain distributed ledger finance is network topology. There are centralized models, decentralized models based on hubs and spokes, and distributed models based on individual peer nodes. This is important because the radical implication of peer-to-peer -peer networks is that any node can deliver services to others for a small transaction fee. Already this is how transaction confirmation and logging occurs with the mining operation, how transaction ledger hosting occurs, and how some decentralized news services properties, such as Steemit and yours, operate. The future is, includes the implication that a new technology like payment channels might allow peer banking services that each node could provide 
validation and confirmation and transfer of financial transactions to other nodes for a small fee. This is really radical because a payment channel is a concept of a technology in three steps. Uh, first of all, there is an opening transaction between myself and another party in a maximum amount of a certain value. Then I book my consumption against this credit payment, this escrow, on file. And then the third step is that there is a final transaction of aggregate cumulative net activity, one, one transaction at the end that closes the contract. It's important because meanwhile there's been, the two parties are contractually obligated and the transaction is open and then we just merely track activity during the period of the contract and then close it later. So this is a temporal consumption, prepaid escrow consumption contract. I think that there could be at least four different levels of a payment channel. First is a one-to-one -one, uh, party transaction. It's myself and another party tracking expenses over a monthly period, say. Second form, or second level, could be small group payments, where we have three different parties, such as myself and the bartender, my friend and the bartender, and my friend and I playing pool together in an example that's been used. Instead of having each of us having to settle unilaterally at the end of the night, uh, we all settle on a net basis. The third level is a multi-hop payment graph envisioned by the Lightning Network, where every node might offer peer services or there might be hubs, and there are some that is the concept. There are many different ways in which this might be done and in which this might be problematic, but the concept is uh, vast peer-peer um, networks that are financial graphs. Then the fourth level of the concept would be that the smart network instantiates banking services automatically and ambiently, sensing demand, just like Mike Hearn and others have envisioned that self-driving cars might sense network demand for services automatically instantiate themselves and start offering services. So because everything is on a trustless computational network, there's no need for human-backed uh, peer nodes. The peer nodes of the network themselves can offer the service. If we think about how the payment channel concept might play out in a wider basis in the economy, it's really quite startling. We could have digitalized money and payments and activity securely forward committed in payment contracts. The implication of this is that the economy could settle on the basis of net rather than gross flows. A net clearing contracts for difference economy could rethink the crippling monolithic debt structures with streaming money disgorged in much smaller chunks, more closely tied to costs and repayment possibilities. Prepaid consumption and 30, 60, 90 day vendor terms could be offset, the prepaid consumption and postpaid consumption models could be offset to facilitate a directed payment graph economy of just in time money. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am talking about payment channels today in the context of blockchain economics. The slides are available online at slideshare.net forward slash lablaga. I'm a technology theorist in the philosophy department at Purdue University. I have a Wall Street background, an MBA in finance and accounting, and I'm currently theorizing technologies such as blockchain. I wrote a book called Blockchain, it's the O'Reilly book, uh, suggesting how a vision for how we might build this world together. I'd like us to put on our mindset of innovation and consider the killer apps of blockchain. Somebody is going to create the Netscape and Google of blockchain that really makes this technology mainstream and useful. Payment channels are concerned different kinds of ways that we use economics and finance, which are basically just systems for organizing access to resources. It's important to consider the radical implication of distributed networks, which unlike centralized networks or decentralized networks, which are based on hubs and spokes, in distributed networks, uh, the implication is that every node is a peer that can provide services to other peers. 
That's how the current Bitcoin blockchain operates right now, in that nodes deliver services to others, possibly for a small fee. Transaction ledger hosting is conducted by about 10 or currently 11,000 Bitcoin D nodes running the full ledger worldwide. The mining operation uh, confirms and logs transactions, and that's conducted by other peer uh, participants. There are starting to be new services, a decentralized version of Reddit, conceptually, uh, called Steemit and yours. And the implication is that with new technologies like payment channels, what, that each peer might be able to provide banking services. Essentially, every cell phone becomes a bank. So the concept of payment channels is that uh, there are two important concepts to understand in regard to payment channels. First is from uh, computer science of networks. A network is a graph. It's composed of vertices and edges, nodes and the relations between these nodes. The earliest uh, problem identified by this uh, of a network is Euler, uh, identifying the seven bridges of Königsberg in the 1800s and how they're connected, how there is relationality and an optimization in terms of routing um, across the network of nodes for uh, entailing to get to any particular location. So the first thing we want to consider is that now with blockchain technology, money is running, finance is running on networks and we don't really know what that is yet. Uh, the second key concept behind payment channels is that of net clearing. So instead of clearing transactions on a gross transfers basis, they could clear on a net basis. So what this means is that we could have essentially a contracts for difference economy. A contract for difference or spread bet is concept and instrument known in finance. In uh, finance, so you could bet on how much IBM is going to go up, not uh, by the whole underlying uh, and so this is a leverage, and when it's used in finance, contracts for difference are typically leveraged just like op options at 10 times the amount. Um, but the, when I think of the contracts for difference concept in terms of economic terms, I'm just meaning it as, um, as another, as a synonym for net clearing or, um, or uh, spread betting, a net settlement. The key idea is that uh, settlement could be on a net basis rather than a gross basis. And that would imply that lots less money is shifting hands, which means that we could rethink how we do debt and many other kinds of operations uh, in society. Um, and so then, uh, relatedly, the idea with payment channels is that you might run an account, have a run a tab, or have an account with any uh, any kind of party, individuals, corporations, institutions, um, in this new kind of um, payment channel economy. More specifically, a payment channel is a three-step financial contract executed over time. First, one party opens a payment channel with another party and posts a prepayment escrow balance on file. The party then consumes against this credit over the given time period. Activity, consumed activity is tracked, but not um, uh, booked to the main ledger. Then number three, at the end of the period, cumulative activity is booked in one net transaction to close the contract. The motivation for payment channels is to improve scalability uh, through having contractually obligated relationships booked as periodic net activity. So you run a tab, you run a tab with all kinds of different vendors, and then periodically activity is closed out and actually recognized. The um, incentive for payment channels came for, from micropayments, say for watching YouTube videos, where it doesn't make sense to have piecemeal transactions for every minute of time consumed. Although um, um, different kinds of micro uh, payment channel applications in browsers do track consumption, say, on a per second basis and settle it out. And that is one of the first examples of payment contracts, but the idea is that they might apply much more widely in the economy. The bigger implication of payment channels is that they might develop into a digitized payment system for resource consumption that settles based on net payments instead of gross transfers and enables peer-to-peer -peer banking services. This kind of, uh, there's a much more sophisticated functionality available already in the Bitcoin blockchain than I'm going to get into because this is not a technical talk. Um, basically, you can do payment channels right now in the Bitcoin blockchain because there are opcodes such as check lock time verify and check sequence verify. 
and you would need to do a lot of programming, but the core, the functionality to do future locked payments and tracking mechanisms, essentially a payment channel, already exists currently in the Bitcoin blockchain. And it's just that uh, the Lightning Network is a platform dedicated to this that runs on the, heart, the new version of Bitcoin, the software update with SegWit 2x that's being implemented in November 2017. And so that means that um, really any wallet, any new wallet may become payment channel enabled and it may be quite easy, in fact, to just enter a payment contract uh, directly on your phone as opposed to having to script it yourself right now. So I'm going to discuss five levels of payment channel applications. The first and most straightforward is the Starbucks example. So in this case, um, a customer might open up a $50 monthly payment channel with Starbucks. Um, daily coffees are consumed and tracked against this $50 credit. And then at the end of the period, activity is netted at the end of the month, say, and the contract is closed and rolled over. They, if it's going to be a regular ongoing uh, contract, they might have a regular rollover period. Um, either party may close the payment channel at any time and settle, do the gross or the uh, cumulative settlement at any moment. Um, I submit that, in fact, Starbucks is already running a prototype version of a payment channel through their loyalty program because 41% of Starbucks purchases are via loyal, the loyalty cards or apps program that they have, which for them um, means a $1.2 billion obligation on their balance sheet. So they, on the one side, have $1.2 billion of cash uh, easily earned from their loyalty program, and that's booked on the, the offsetting entry is booked as a stored value card obligation um, on the liability side of the balance sheet for $1.2 billion. So already in the simple, the most simple, straightforward case of a payment channel, we might start to wonder about accounting and legal treatment. The great promise of cryptocurrencies is that they're programmable money, and we start to see that in implementation in payment channels. The degree of discretion and autonomy with which contracts and relationships might be specified. Um, this kind, this new kind of thing, a contingent three-part financial contract over time is a new beast, a new kind of financial instrument. We see that it has elements of recognizable features of other financial contracts, such as prepayment risk. Either party can close a contract at any time, and that is a big feature of the mortgage industry, for example. Likewise, there is option functionality in payment contracts, the European or American style option execution, um, and also possibly the, the idea of leverage. So fractional reserves, right now the payment channel concept is you put up your full credit balance, your escrow on file, and that can be only committed on a one-to-one -one direct basis to finance um, as a credit to finance activity. But what if there could be fractional reserves and what does that imply? Is that, danger is that too much risk um, or is that uh, actually a benefit because I'm, I can only have as much as my current credit, uh, current cash balance is locked up in a payment channel. Um, so uh, in other words, if I have $50 booked with Starbucks, I can't use that same $50 to also be booked with Netflix. So from an accounting perspective, are payment channels deferred payment uh, contracts, installment sales? When are, is it appropriate to recognize re uh, revenue and liability? From a legal perspective, are payment contracts, assignments of claims, or forward-looking IOUs? So all of this would need to be uh, settled. Payment channels level two. These are small group concatenated payments. So this example has been discussed by Andreas Antonopoulos, and this is a case of we have a, your local bar, we have Lynn and Chris and a bartender. Uh, Lynn is running a $10 tab with a bartender and has consumed $6. Uh, Chris ha also has a $10 tab with a bartender and has consumed $5 towards this. Lynn and Chris play pool and Chris ends up owing Lynn $5. So I've listed the, the ledgers of how the balances of who owes whom what uh, work out. And in the current method, which is gross settlement, each party would settle with each other on a one-to-one -one basis. That would involve three transactions and $16 of gross uh, monetary flow. But in the new math method, the, the net settlement method, via your app on your phone, 
uh, so you wouldn't have to think about it um, and do the math after you've had some beers, there would be two transactions and $11 of gross flows transferred. So already the implication is that less money would transfer in a payment channel economy, and that means more is available for other kinds of things. Payment channels level three. This is the example of my monthly expenses. So I argue that we're already running a de, de facto payment channels in a lot of ways, even in the way we conduct our own, uh, own individual operations right now. And what if a payment channel could just bypass me as an intermediary party and settle my monthly inflows and outflows for me uh, with just the net uh, credit or debit out to whatever entity at the end? You don't actually really need me in the middle, but it does happen to be my Chase bank account that clears everything right now. So this is in the sense that many people are, all, in fact, obligated to have direct deposit of their paychecks. So that comes into your checking account. And then your outflows, in many cases, are also auto pays. So these are for both fixed and variable costs, say your mortgage payment, your car payment, your utility bills. A lot of these are auto pay. And then, um, then at the end, there could be a, the whatever net amount might go out to an investment account at Schwab or whatever. So already, you're, I argue that my monthly expenses for, for, um, for people that are interested in this could be organized and formalized into a net, a net um, payment channel format um, such that this would streamline, uh, again, streamline the economy and it implies that the net settlement basis causes less capital to transfer and therefore leaves more available for other kinds of things like debt repayment. So not only my personal monthly expenses might be considered in a payment channel format, uh, but also businesses, business entities. So I think about my monthly expenses, then I think about my apartment building's monthly expenses. So again, they have, uh, in a payment channel, the net inflows could be booked, the uh, net outflows could be booked in terms of fixed and variable expenses, and then the net profit or loss um, also booked per contractual details. The um, my apartment building, as well as my small business, is in the same, all businesses are organized and all entities, in fact, are organized around this same kind of structure of inflows and outflows uh, with some sort of net. And so this could all be organized in the future in a payment channel structure. So moving up a step would be my supply chain, the payment graph economy. So this is some of the more radical um, kinds of ideas of what might need to happen. So we're curious about how to actually roll payment channels and the blockchain economy into industrial supply chains, goods and services. And so I think what needs to happen for that is that we need to have integrated ledgers. So instead of um, one set of general ledger accounting books for each entity, each business, we actually have an integrated ledger system across the supply chain. So Walmart, for example, books the revenue, but the COGS and inventory accounts belong to their vendors, uh, John Deere tractors and Adidas shoes, for example. And then that extends the work in progress and the materials accounts roll downstream to the supply chain vendors that, that are responsible for the next level of activity further down in the supply chain. And so the great benefit of blockchains is if we think about the property of Merkel routing or synecdoche is another way to say it, that any small piece calls the whole large piece. This property allows us to have arbitrary, arbitrarily many levels of detail roll up and roll down. And so we would still, of course, have accounting books at the level of entity, as we do now for individuals and entities, businesses, government, institutions, etc. So one view of the accounting ledger would be by entity, and that's how we obligate taxes and responsibility, licensing, and so forth. But there could be, because of the synecdoche, synecdoche or Merkle rooting property of blockchains, we could also have a view of ledgers across whole business lines, across the whole supply chain. So here the concept is right now, the uh, blockchain is only dealing with one account on the whole general ledger so far, and that's the cash account. So we keep, uh, we have essentially the Bitcoin blockchain is a giant 
um, giant subledger based cash account ledger. Uh, Bob owes, owns, uh, Bob has this much cash um, in terms of unspent um, transaction outputs on the Bitcoin blockchain. Alice has this amount, but it's all just a cash and one big cash ledger. So we didn't even start to consider all of the full range of accounting accounts in um, on the general ledger in the general ledger, which include the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow. And so once we get all of these accounts operating in interoperable shared ledgers across supply chains, that will allow us to do net clearing on a much larger basis, um, on a cross-entity basis as opposed to an individual entity basis. And that's what we were, are really going to need to attack the debt problem. Um, and so related to this is that two-thirds of the economy is tied up in supply chain finance, and that's because the incentive is to play the float. There are completely different trajectories in terms of the goods production timing and trajectory um, and the incentives for what operates in the actual production of goods, production, distribution, and consumption of goods from the um, payments trajectory for that. And that's a completely separate beast that has different kinds of incentives, the biggest one of which is to play the float. So um, when I'm a large vendor, my incentive is to uh, not is to delay my payments to vendors as long as possible because I'm going to theoretically in the in the former world make make more interest on the float. Uh, but still, the the incentive is to hold cash on hand the maximum amount of time possible. And so, if the the incentives with shared ledgers, then the incentive structures uh, in business might change to be much more of one of a just in time economy, not only for goods but for money. So we've gone to a just-in-time economy for over the 20, last 20 years for goods, just-in-time uh, delivery of uh, physical material goods, but we haven't come to a just-in-time market for money in the industrial supply chain. And so I'm arguing that integrated ledgers is something that would allow us to do this. And that would certainly be by some variety, some big experiment of public and private ledgers, initially quite private ledgers. So just like there is in the current supply chain world, electro EDIs and VPNs, um, where there is some amount of corporate data sharing, that, would, that could be facilitated and extended through private blockchains. And then it would also allow what I'm starting to talk about, which is an integrated um, ledger view, a shared, a, uh, shared ledgers within the same business line. And that is what is going to allow us. So if we're looking at the whole supply chain as an entity, as opposed to businesses as entities, then we can get net flows rolling across the supply chain. Level four payment channels, the Kevin Bacon example. So one of the initial proposals with payment channels was, uh, look, I wanna pay for my Airbnb in Europe, but I don't know anybody in Spain. So how can, I, how can I do a Bitcoin transaction with them? And so part of the idea was, well, the Kevin Bacon problem, well, certainly I don't know that person in Spain, but a few hops in the network, and we can probably get a path going over to that other person. Um, but the idea with these payment graphs, credit graphs, is that you don't actually have to find people, you just hop on the network and the payment graph um, routes you. In fact, you don't need to, A, there is a path, pathway, a Kevin Bacon pathway to the person you're trying to reach, um, but B, you don't even have to know it. The network sorts it out for you amongst participating nodes in the network. As I mentioned, essentially every cell phone is a bank or is a, a banking network hop uh, and can route your transaction along. So the result is that we have essentially a very large network payment graph for money. So just like the internet, we transfer information, we transfer money on, on, the, uh, on credit graphs. And one benefit is that unlike the internet, you need to reassemble the packets in the correct order once they get to their destination. But, that, but that's not so with money. We don't really care. All the packets, uh, all the iota, all the quanta money need to get there in one, uh, one big chunk at the end, and be assembled in one chunk, but the order doesn't matter. Um, so possibly, so on the one hand, it's much more complicated than internet packet routing uh, because of the double spend problem. We only want unique uh, packets sent and uh, there's vastly more security involved with money. The digital signatures to confirm that it is just only this 
particular quanta or packet of money arriving currently. Um, but on the other hand, it's uh, perhaps um, it could be easier than uh, some of the internet traffic transfer protocols currently in other ways, and the ways that the packets don't have to be assembled in a particular order at the other end. Um, so some of the different ideas for how concepts like the night lightning network might unfold in practice are either that every node is peer banker, um, so my wallet is permission to clear transactions and make small transaction fees on that. So for example, right now during this talk, my wallet is clearing coffee for a couple of people in the lobby that are buying coffee, and I make a couple of cents for that. So my, uh, my peer app provides a banking confirmation, banking service of a confirmation of parties having the ability to transfer those funds. Um, and then the other idea is that uh, perhaps not every node is a peer banker, but that there are hubs or payment gateways. And that might be how things start to roll out initially uh, until we really work through this concept. It's a live sandboxing all the time uh, with, with things like the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, even though, well, apps are running a lot on the test net, but uh, since it's money, we want to proceed slowly and really make sure we're understanding everything that's happening and also the risks of uh, any kind of malfeasance that might be incentivized on the networks. Payment channels level five, the Mike Hearn example. So Mike Hearn, I call this a Mike Hearn example because he suggested the idea that at some moment, uh, blockchain networks would be smart enough to auto-sense demand and auto-instantiate entities to respond to that de uh, demand. So we might have in the farther future the possibility of auto-instantiating self-driving cars that sense a need because, oh, there's a trade show in at, at airport XYZ. So we have a 5, five to 20 percent influx of transportation demand that we don't have. So we need to uh, we need a, a just-in-time resource to respond to that. And the network would sense this demand and respond to it. And so the same idea could be applied to the concept of banking and financial services. So just like uh, the smart network senses demand for transportation picking up, the smart network might instantiate banking services directly, um, sensing, sensing the demand for certain kinds of credit and banking services, auto instantiating responses to that, providing services, and retiring when necessary. Also pricing those services which could be something that uh, deep learning networks or other kinds of um, sophisticated computing technologies contribute uh, to. Um, so deep learning networks could be used for two different kinds of applications and those are uh, basically for estimating the fees and pricing and then also for fraud detection. So the patterns trying to pick up the anti uh, uh, trying to pick up the money laundering activity in cryptographic networks because there's a much different signature um, traffic signature pattern than um, bona fide traffic. And then um, the possibility of having auto instantiating banking services on payment graphs suggests or makes us notice that in fact the network node does not actually need to be human backed. So from a technical perspective, people don't need to be involved. We're already depending on cryptographic software as the trustless intermediary that switches our transactions that we don't need to trust third party institutions with our transactions anymore. And so while we have um, historically, we, we vest uh, the responsibility and the role of different kinds of um, uh, legal aspects in personhood. But that is not necessarily, that doesn't need to be the case from a technical perspective on payment graphs. So there could be a question, well, uh, is a graph, a graph, a network, uh, the next form of legal personhood? Um, and how autonomous um, and what rights and responsibilities, for example, do transnational superorganism networks have? So these are all uh, questions for the future. Uh, implications of payment channels. <clears throat> With money and payment channels digitized and activity becoming securely forward committed by payment contracts, the implication is that net flows instead of gross flows might be transferred. An economy based on net clearings rather than gross transfers could mean more activity and less debt. 
Finally, we can rethink a marquee problem of our era, debt, with the idea of streaming money proposed by Andreas Antonopoulos and others that could be disgorged in much smaller chunks that are more closely tied to costs and repayment possibilities. The challenge is how to construct net rather than gross obligations for home mortgages, student loans, public works projects, and bond offerings. So if I start to think about different larger scale operations in my immediate environment, for example, at my university, how could we move, start to move certain pieces of economic activity into a net contract basis as opposed to a gross flow? And that does absolutely imply much greater integration and trust between parties and probably a change in incentives. So there could be substantial resistance. Um, and I think overall that um, what net, net clearing means that we have more flavors. Um, just like now we have, cent we have chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. We have um, centralized, decentralized, and distributed networks. Sometimes one is, uh, one is better for a particular operation and for complicated operations, hybrid networks are best. Um, so similarly with payment channels, so we just start to have more flavors. So instead of having to transfer everything on a gross basis, we now can start to transfer certain uh, discrete applications on a net basis. And so it's up to us to start to try to figure this out. So for example, I wouldn't want my whole personal finances to be locked up in net settling payment contracts, but for the sake of ease and freeing up my um, available credit for debt for new business projects, then I'm happy to obligate my known monthly expenses, for example, into a payment contract structure because that will allow me to borrow more on my credit line to set up my new uh, deep qualia business and give me access to capital. I can get access to capital by reorganizing how I do my own personal finances. And this will be tremendous, uh, a tremendous benefit to entrepreneurs. So uh, conceptually, we, we can rethink the different kinds of modes of consumption that we have, prepay credit versus postpay. So only a small portion of overall economic activity is currently conducted in prepaid uh, consumption. And that's where payment channels are playing so far in the, in the concept, which would be put up a, a prepayment escrow and book activity against, book consumption against that and net it out at the end. Um, but pre we can't lock up, we can't do the whole economy on prepaid, on a prepaid escrow basis. Uh, we can do it on a, a terms and uh, run a tab basis, which is how the supply chain works currently. So I mentioned that two thirds of the economy is tied up in supply chain finance because incentives are to play the float. But digitized streaming money and payment channels might be techniques to quicken the 30, day, 30 60, 90 day terms and uncollectible debt problem in supply chain finance and facilitate a just-in-time economy for money. We think because uh, Lightning is, we're hoping Lightning is coming with many interesting payment channel possibilities in November with the upgrade to SegWit2, the hard fork on the Bitcoin blockchain, um, but payment graphs have already been existing in finance for some time. The Ripple Credit Network has been operating for five years already. And there are some uh, interesting studies published by uh, some uh, researchers at Purdue University in the computer science department that have looked at this. Um, so one interesting thing about the Ripple network is that uh, the first thing we might want to notice is that uh, transactions are highly interoperable. You can do, it's not just cryptocurrency exchanges at all. There is cross-border fiat remittance, there is cryptocurrency exchange, there is user-defined currencies as an available functionality, and in their recently introduced inter uh, ILP, integrated ledger payment, um, that it doesn't matter. It's, like, uh, it's just like email. It doesn't matter what, uh, what network or what app somebody else is using. Maybe I'm transferring money, I want to transfer money to somebody in China using Alipay, or somebody in Zimbabwe using Bitcoin or with fiat currency or PayPal. So the payment method starts to become uh, transparent. It doesn't matter anymore who's using what. We can all interoperate. So it's interoperability for payment methods. 
Second main point about Ripple is the extensive wallet functionality. So not just is it access to cash, but it's access to credit and the ability to issue credit. Every wallet can access cash, access credit, and issue credit. Um, so the, the research has looked at uh, the period from the uh, beginning of 2013 to the end of 2016 and reviewed um, the Ripple Credit Network where there are almost 100,000 wallets, 99,413 wallets, 246,000 credit links, and 27.4 million transactions have taken place on the Ripple Credit Network. 12 of the world's 50 top banks belong to the network. And it's uh, quite interesting. It's an open network in that any, any party can join. And it's comprised of large payment gateways and money um, um, market makers. So any individual is encouraged to be a market maker and provide these exchange services between the different uh, currencies and transactions on the network. The consensus mechanism is via validators, which, of which there are 55 currently that confirm the transactions. And new transaction blocks settle every four seconds. So that's uh, quite a bit faster than the eight to seven to eight minutes of the Bitcoin blockchain currently. Here's an example of the Ripple credit network which is the network is a weighted directed payment graph of IOU credit links. And the credit graph essentially that they're comprised of vertices and edges like any graph where the vertices or the nodes are the wallets and tra track the wallet balances and the edges have the credit links, the amount of credit links uh, one or both ways between nodes on the network. So this is part of the uh, conceptual point that um, d cryptocurrencies means that finance is running on networks and that's really a different kind of thing that we're only just starting to understand what that is and entails uh, from every kind of perspective. <clears throat> However, I agree, I argue that payment graphs, um, payment graphs are, are not such a new new thing but they're merely the next step in the automatic markets progression. We're used to algorithmic trading in high frequency, tra uh, high frequency trading hedge funds, for example. We're used to already the real-time bidding market for advertising, the highly digitized market for global energy trading that's automated for the production, storage, and transmission of energy across large geographical networks and distributed energy management systems. So the next steps, um, this involves banking and finance, which is, since it's related to money, is automatically more sensitive. But there is a precedent for moving our world towards these automated markets examples. And in banking and finance, we have already Ripple that's been in, in operation for five years with 27 million transactions. Um, Definity, um, which has a prototype app out there doing automated commercial loan approval. And the other example of Facebook payments, which is a social graph, which becomes a payment graph, which is an interesting uh, merging of two different kinds of networks. And then so Lightning, uh, the Lightning Network and these payment channel possibilities on blockchains uh, are just part of the same transition to payment graphs, uh, the market as a graph, and automated markets more generally. In conclusion, <coughs> I think uh, the biggest question is how can we use these concepts and tools to solve another class of economic problems? There's an economic, uh, a lot of problems right now are that the economic incentives are completely um, at, at odds with the outcome that we're wanting to produce. So debt is the number one kind of area for this. Um, another area is supply chain where the incentive is to play the float, to not pay as long as possible. Healthcare is another uh, domain where there's a maximization of service consumption incentive as opposed to a price rationalization incentive. Entitlements, could we have social security payment channels, for example? What about income equality and the digital divide, the automation economy and technological unemployment? These are the kinds of, of uh, future class economic problems that are facing us right now and so my biggest curiosity is how can we use payment concepts like blockchains, payment channels, distributed ledgers, credit graphs, etc. 
to solve this bigger class of economic problem. And so, for example, one particular area is even just that of having to own stocks. So right now you have to own your own investment assets. But uh, we could possibly have securities as a service, which uh, just like the Uber economy, where we don't have to own the underlying asset anymore to have access to the consumable benefits. And we've moved this way with streaming music services, uh, TV and media consumption, Uber and Airbnb. And so the next class of assets to be able to do the, to move to an Uber economy with would be securities um, as a demonst nice demonstration proof. A couple of resources to mention. There are some uh, recent publications in October 2017 on both blockchain philosophy and blockchain economics that I've been involved with that I encourage uh, you to check out. These are intended as conceptual resources to help us build this uh, um, unfolding world. I also have a book CFP open at the moment with collaborators at blockchain economics institutes worldwide. We're looking for 4,000 word chapters due by March 1st, 2018 to me. And the CFP is right on the blockchainstudies.org um, website. Finally, here are some uh, di uh, distributed ledger technology standards bodies on the accounting and internet uh, computing side that are the place to start to get involved because the quicker we have standards for implementing blockchain technologies into the large and vast way that we do a variety of operations across the economy means the faster the uptake of the, of the benefits of these technologies. Thank you.